Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Is it six o'clock? Uh, I just passed. Just passed. The, the sun sorry. is just the sun is just coming up. That's cool. I'm I'm really sorry for the delay. I was I was not prepared for one hour delay if it comes to your uh, presentation. Um, uh, so I'm gonna talk a few more words in Polish and the stage will be yours. So give me a minute. Więc drodzy, drodzy kochani widzowie, Chris będzie mówił w języku angielskim, będzie mówił o algorytmach przewidywań, jeżeli chodzi o, o poziomy cukru i e, zapotrzebowania na insulinę, czyli tak zwanego ISF faktora. U niego jest szósta rano, więc trzymajcie kciuki, bo jest bardzo wcześnie. Miała być piąta rano w ogóle, więc tak godzinę pozwoliliśmy mu, żeby się nam troszeczkę wybudził. E, I... Uh, Chris, uh, the people on, on the chat are writing hi from Poland so early. Um, so, hi from Poland. Uh, have fun. Hello, everyone. And I'm really <laughs> excited to hear your speech. So, just share your screen and let's start. Okay. Loading. Yes, it's here. So you can here? go ahead. All right. Ready to go. If you need me, just uh, just say it out loud and I'm going to, you know, a few seconds and I'm going to be on. Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is my presentation on insulin delivery algorithms. Uh, my name is Chris Wilson. Uh, a little bit about me before I get started. I've lived with type 1 diabetes for almost 25 years now. Uh, I've worked in information technology for over 20 years. It's actually close to 30. Uh, I got my first job working with computers when I was still in high school. Uh, I've frequently participated in clinical research as a research subject. And one of the things that's always frustrated me is when doctors don't listen to their patients or they don't believe that their patients are what are telling them or whatever. Uh, and I also get frustrated with systems that aren't as smart as we are, systems that can't manage diabetes as well as we do. So I really think that uh, the observations that we have as people living with type one uh, can provide insights and information uh, that is useful in managing diabetes and informing how we do that. And uh, it's, uh, th this is sort of, we'll, at the end, we'll get to the, the first sort of insight that I've uh, gleaned from uh, looking at what patients actually do. Uh, before we get started, I also want to define what I mean when I say an algorithm. Uh, an algorithm is just a step-by-step -step set of instructions uh, for making a decision. And I have a few examples on here. Uh, you know, starting with the simple one and then getting more complex. So in the very beginning, we had insulin pumps and CGMs, but they're two independent devices. They uh, don't speak to each other. And if you want to know what's going on uh, with everything involved in your uh, blood sugar management, Uh, you needed to look at one device and then look at another device and put all the information together and then make a decision as to what to do. Uh, that started to change when we got what are referred to as sensor augmented pumps. Uh, these are pumps that act directly as a receiver for continuous glucose monitoring data. Uh, it puts all the data together in one place, which is great, but it still isn't doing anything with that data. And... Moving towards actually letting the pump take action based on the data that it uh, that it's receiving is where we get into algorithms. You know, the very first insulin uh, delivery algorithm is low glucose suspend. Uh, it's very very simple. It just says if the blood sugar reading is low, do not deliver insulin. It, uh, that's that's it. It's the, the simplest algorithm possible in the world, basically. Uh, and uh, examples of current pumps that you will see with this uh, still include the Medtronic 630G. Uh, 
the next sort of step uh, or advancement in this is actually using the CGM values to predict when blood glucose will go low and uh, stop insulin ahead of time so that you can try to prevent that low from ever actually happening. Uh, examples of this are uh, the basal IQ software that uh, Tandem Diabetes has in their T-Slim insulin pump and also the Medtronic 640G. Uh, but then we can uh, get even more advanced. We can actually start to close the loop, uh, let things run autonomously. And the very first uh, closed loop system that became available, a hybrid closed loop, uh, which just means that in addition to reducing or stopping insulin, it can actually increase it as well uh, to help control high blood sugars. Uh, and this would be like the Medtronic 670 or 770. And then we get to sort of the, the current uh, state of the art as far as commercially available systems are concerned. Uh, these are advanced hybrid closed loop systems, which in addition to just increasing or decreasing basal insulin can actually give bolus doses uh, to help correct or prevent high blood sugars. And there's a number of examples here. We've got the uh, Omnipod 5, which was just approved in the United States. Uh, Medtronic has a 780G, uh, Tandem offers Control IQ, uh, Cam APS FX is an option, and Diaboloop also uh, makes a uh, control software uh, that falls into this category. But the problem is that we, with all of these systems as advanced as they are, uh, they've all sort of hit a plateau. Uh, if you look at the, the clinical data that was submitted to various regulatory agencies uh, for CE marking or for the FDA in the US, uh, most of the time in children, it's only getting uh, blood sugars in range about 65% of the time. Uh, it's about 75% of the time on average in adults. Uh, people still need to give boluses when they are eating. Uh, meal boluses are still required, uh, but the sensors that are giving us the blood glucose readings are improving. But a lot of the, the development here is really uh, seems to be focused on improvements to the user interface, uh, minor items like uh, being able to adjust the target blood sugar that the system is aiming for. And this is where we come to we are not waiting. This is the do-it-yourself uh, community that creates uh, systems like Android APS. And uh, this do-it-yourself community has really led the way in pushing technology forward. Uh, there's a bunch of examples of things that have come from patients uh, looking to solve problems and that have actually led to commercial implementations. Uh, remote CGM monitoring, uh, Dexcom's share service was actually done first by Night Scout and Night Scout continues to sort of be the, the central hub uh, for a lot of the do-it-yourself things. Building on top of that, we had the very first advanced hybrid closed loop systems, uh, the first systems that offered adjustable targets and the first systems that offered the ability to bolus from your phone. Uh, and some of these things are brand new. They've only just been approved in commercial systems for the first time in the past month or so. Uh, we also have some things that are exclusive to the do-it-yourself systems. Uh, the ability to control the pump and deliver boluses from your watch is something that is not available in any commercial system, at least that I'm aware of. Uh, and there are advanced customization and op automation options that can uh, people can select various rhythms and cycles for changes in their basal needs uh, to combat things like dawn phenomenon in the morning when you're waking up and you get an instant blood sugar spike. Uh, but the newest thing that has been introduced into this do-it-yourself ecosystem is dynamic insulin sensitivity calculations. Uh, and this is sort of the, the work that I've been doing, and I'm excited that it's actually getting out to help people now. So dynamic insulin sensitivity. Uh, we've known for a while 
that insulin sensitivity does change with uh, changes in blood sugar levels. Uh, this was actually noted in a poster presentation at diabetes technology meeting in 2018 uh, by a group from Diaboloop. Uh, they had uh, key findings from their, uh, their paper is that there is a correlation between insulin sensitivity and the glycemic level. And they stated that the use of a uh, correction ratio modulated by that blood sugar level will probably inf improve diabetes management by allowing for better bolus sizing. And this led me to sort of a, a revelation here. The, the problem isn't the algorithms. It's not the decisions that are being made to increase or decrease the uh, amount of blood or the uh, amount of insulin being delivered but it's actually the the underlying math that those algorithms are using to calculate how much insulin to deliver or to not deliver. So dynamic insulin sensitivity actually enables you to better predict the effect that insulin will have. Uh, it get, can be recalculated as often as every five minutes, uh, every single time a new uh, glucose monitor reading is received. Uh, the formula that I use is based on correction bolus data as far as patterns of how people bolus in response to various blood sugars from about 50 people. Uh, the sort of exciting thing about it is that it actually provides a mathematical guide for how to scale all of the, uh, the, the various insulin bolus doses that are uh, being administered. Uh, but it's not a change to the the rules that the algorithms are following. It's not a change to if blood sugar is high, give more insulin. If blood sugar is low, give less insulin. It's a change to the math that uh, the systems are using to calculate how much insulin to deliver. Uh, and I will note that how much those things change uh, is not peer reviewed. Uh, when I did this survey, I didn't follow all the guidelines, so I uh, can't use it to publish in a journal and actually get it peer reviewed. But this is uh, the formula that I derived, and there's a graphical representation of it. Uh, and it's looking at the insulin sensitivity in three dimensions. Uh, we sort of already knew that uh, there is a relationship between how much insulin you use on average per day and the uh, glucose lowering effect of that insulin. This just sort of adds in the uh, additional consideration of what the blood sugar level is and how that will affect how effective the insulin is. And the question is, does this really work? And so far, it really looks like it does. Uh, there's still uh, changes being made to the implementation. Uh, some of the inputs that go into this, how you're calculating uh, total daily insulin that you're using. Uh, there's a couple of different methods, various averages and weightings, uh, and people are still working out exactly what the best one is or what the best one is for some people. Uh, but there are experimental implementations of this now. Uh, there is an implementation in Android APS uh, that's been done by Tim Street, who presented here last year. Uh, there is an experimental, but not 100% complete uh, implementation in what they call middleware in a uh, controller for iPhone that's called Free APS X. Uh, and the preliminary data that people who are trying this out are and are sharing with uh, Tim and myself and some others that are working on this is that they are seeing less time above 180 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, it's about half. They're seeing less time low. That's also reduced by about half. And the standard deviation, how much their blood sugars go up and down, is reduced by about 20 to 30 percent. These are uh, a couple of uh, reports that people have shared uh, in doing their testing. Uh, th this first one here, uh, 
the person started out at a very high baseline. They were already more than 91% uh, of the time with their blood sugars in the target range. They switched over to uh, a version using this dynamic insulin sensitivity uh, where it's using uh, the last 24 hours to calculate total daily insulin. Uh, time in a range went up to 96%. Uh, and they cut lows and highs approximately in half. This is another person who uh, shared some of their results. Uh, they started with a baseline of 86% time and range. They're up to 94. Uh, again, lows are reduced and highs are reduced. And uh, this person's standard deviation was reduced by about 25%. And we're not done yet. Uh, there's a couple of issues that people have reported. Some people who have uh, eat very low carb diets have reported that uh, they don't feel that the insulin sensitivity factors that they're getting from the system uh, are sufficient. Uh, we're, we're investigating that. Uh, we think that actually it may be that they've been, had their basal insulin set too low and that they may be compensating by giving additional bolus. Uh, but uh, if that's not the whole thing, uh, this may require uh, making adjustments available. And there are even a couple of experimental implementations now that uh, are working on allowing people to adjust some of the parameters involved in that insulin sensitivity. Uh, so as I said, uh, implementation is still being refined. Uh, that includes uh, sort of recommendations as far as uh, what to do with your system. A lot of people actually have custom automations that uh, change insulin sensitivity when their blood sugar becomes higher or increase it when their blood sugar becomes lower. Uh, those are no longer needed, uh, most people are finding, because the math actually does that adjustment for them. So where are we going from here? Uh, what's what's next beyond this? And uh, I think the, the key next step is adaptability. Uh, rather than expecting the results for an individual person to exactly fit the math that we are using, we can adapt the math to make that reflect what the person is doing. So if we can actually define the mathematical function as I have uh, to describe those shifts in insulin sensitivity, then we can uh, just by adding or subtracting it various portions within the mathematical equation, uh, shift the graph up or down or left or right, uh, and we can make it fit the person rather than just giving up when uh, people see things happening that they don't expect. And the other uh, way that we can move forward with this is uh, going beyond three dimensions. Uh, the current math that we're using doesn't take basal rates into account, and they really should be taken into account. Uh, they're countering the sugar that the liver is putting out uh, just as part of normal life to help give your body fuel to run. Uh, but it's the changes in some of these uh, metrics, the, the change in the insulin on board, which actually insulin on board is fundamentally wrong as a concept. Uh, it's, it's the rate at which insulin is absorbed that's important. Uh, but given a mathematical function that we have that can define how insulin sensitivity shifts, uh, then it gets into derivatives, rates of change of various uh, factors and inputs into that function uh, and looking at those and how those are going to impact uh, the, the changes that we see as well. Uh, the whole idea here is really just to make insulin more predictable. If we can do better predictions of how insulin is going to work, we can dose better because we're always trying to play catch up. Insulin is slow. Uh, getting faster insulins will help, uh, but faster insulins, because they're having more of an effect when they're less effective, uh, it's actually uh, may make this even more important. And obviously accurate blood sugar readings uh, are critical to being able to accomplish what we're doing here. 
Uh, it also introduces the idea of there being time-related factors to a lot of uh, a lot of the underlying math here. Uh, we can ask how quickly do uh, does the human body adapt to changes in the blood sugar level? Uh, this seems to be fairly rapid. Uh, basically, CGMs and insulin are still slow enough that uh, it makes the speed at which this happens functionally instantaneous. Uh, but what happens more slowly is uh, the body adapting to changes in insulin exposure. And this has been shown in a number of different body tissues. Most recently, there was a study published looking at uh, skeletal muscle tissue uh, and showing that as, if you expose it to higher levels of insulin, it actually becomes resistant to that insulin. So it follows that if it's exposed to less insulin, then it becomes more sensitive to it. Uh, so exactly how quickly those shifts occur uh, is going to become uh, an important thing to consider as we move forward in improving and making these algorithms more complicated. Uh, but the really key question is how effective is it at the moment that it's having its effect and how will future ins insulin, because it takes five hours or more for insulin to have its full effect, uh, how will that future insulin that you are going to absorb have its effect and ha uh, how big of an effect will it have? Uh, th this is my vision of the future. It's uh, truly dynamic algorithms that adapt to the person with diabetes. Uh, it's not an expectation that everybody will be the same. It uh, allows systems to adjust themselves based on sort of a feedback loop where uh, it w looks at what was expected, looks at what actually happened, and then adjusts its expectations. Uh, and I think that this mathematical foundation lays out a path that will let us get there. And with that, I am done and I am happy to take any questions. Uh, I see a couple of questions coming in in the chat, so I'll try to uh, answer them while we're waiting for uh, waiting for Jerry to get back. Um, see your question, great work. How can we as normal uh, people with type 1 diabetes uh, help improving the systems and make these easier to do? Uh, yes. I don't know why. I'm here. <laughs> uh, absolutely, sharing data sets uh, is helpful. Uh, I've actually been talking with uh, some people who actually have access to commercial uh, data sets from uh, commercial insulin delivery systems uh, to potentially look at their data and see if there are any insights that can be gleaned. Uh, the methods that they use to extract and interpret that data from their data sets uh, can probably be applied to data that people do have in Night Scout. It's just a question of figuring out what all that data is that we need. I see you're reading. Did you use any machine learning models to estimate uh, dynamic ESF or if it's your one? Uh, I did actually. That was, uh, I, I took all of the data and I uh, graphed it out in three dimensions uh, and then fed that all into a neural network, uh, ran it through, I don't even remember, I think it was like a thousand iterations of uh, analyzing that data. And it was about 300 data points uh, altogether. Uh, and then I determined what the math was the model was using uh, by feeding in known inputs and seeing what the results were and figuring out what that underlying math was. Uh, and oh. so that, and that is the, the sort of result that I got is what the, the model found. Um, Chris, uh, you're aware that I am using your test, uh, your test model. I am, I am your test model for the dynamic ISF, uh, algorithm and I'm using it. I've been using it, uh, for about, I think 10 days. And I think it's really awesome if it comes to. Uh, time in range, but I had COVID uh, 
a few days ago, uh, I just the the flu has ended. So now I think the I'm going to share with you my report later on uh, because the fluctuation in my blood sugar was uh, with the COVID virus. Uh, but tell me, uh, how do you feel on implementing your algorithm into, for example, Medtronic 790 or 820? I don't know what's the future for the Medtronic pumps. Uh, how, how, how are you feeling with that? I'm, I'm happy to get this working, uh, with, with any, any commercial, uh, group that is making insulin pumps and implementing algorithms. Uh, it doesn't matter who it is, it, you know, Omnipod, Medtronic, uh, any Roche, anybody who is making, uh, control systems, uh, for, for insulin pumps, I'm happy to, to work with and, uh, try to get this out into, uh, circulation so that people can use it because I, it, the, the results are at, beyond my expectations that I had going into this. Uh, I, I was shocked to, to look at how much more stable people's blood sugars are. So, uh, and it's not working for everyone, but we are, uh, figuring out why for the, the few people that it's seem to have problems with it, uh, exactly what's going on that's causing those problems. Okay. Uh, we are talking about dynamic ISF uh, factor, but what about uh, carbs on board? Uh, do you see any correlations or did you made some, I don't know, testing involving some algorithms with the QOB factor? I haven't looked into it in depth yet. Uh, the, the ISF was uh, something that was sort of easier to measure, I think. Uh, or at least easier to, to get into people's minds and figure out what they were doing, because all of this data is actually just asking people, how much insulin would you give if your blood sugar was 300? How much insulin would you give if your insulin, if your blood sugar was 250? Uh, and, and so on and so forth. That's the source of the data. It's, it's people's impressions that they've had as patients and what they have figured out actually works for them. And then figuring out what the underlying pattern to that is. Okay, cool. Um, uh, but as far as carbs, uh, I I think there is a lot of room for improvement. Uh, I think there may be better ways to, to correlate the effects that they have uh, and the sort of carb ratios that people use to dose. Uh, the ISF is going to play into that uh, because carbs eventually turn into sugar, which raises your blood sugar. Uh, that's right. So, so they are having that effect, uh, but... Uh, I, I'll, I'll say stay tuned. Uh, I've got some ideas that I'm uh, looking into on that front as well. Looking forward to it. Um, my last question is about um, insulin because um, uh, I am using Fiesp, uh, but I know that Team Street, our last uh, year's uh, uh, speaker, was using LumJeff with your uh, algorithm. And I think LumJeff is more dynamic uh, and faster acting insulin, I think maybe not, uh, uh, didn't use it, but I think it's like a very important thing to have a fast acting insulin for the dynamic ISF to really work well. I, I agree. The faster it is, the, the less you have to worry about the, the, that long tail off the end of the, uh, where, you know, the insulin is still active and still slightly absorbing even five hours after you've, you've administered the dose. Uh, the, the faster it is and the shorter that tail, uh, the, the better and more aggressively we can control blood sugars. And we can probably even tighten some of the ranges that, uh, people are aiming for. Uh, we might be able to, instead of having the, the target range be 70 to 180, which is the current sort of standard international consensus, uh, you know, might, might be lowering that to 160, might be lowering that to 150. Uh, as, as insulins get faster and faster, uh, as long as you have an accurate curve of how you uh, know how well that insulin absorbs and in, in the, the pharmacodynamic profile, they call it, uh, of uh, how it absorbs over time, uh, the, the math appears to at least still work. And it, it's been tested with everything from just standard uh, rapid acting insulins, uh, Novo Rapid, uh, Humalog, and uh, similar up to 
uh, the, the, the new ultra rapid, as you mentioned, uh, Fiaspa Lumjev. So if it comes to the testers that are testing the dynamic ISF, yeah, I was about to ask what kind of insulins do they use? Are you aware of that? It's mostly Fiat or there is a very different. Honestly, I don't know. Uh, the, the, <laughs> this isn't a, uh, this isn't a formal, uh, clinical trial. I know. I'm uh, th this is just, uh, we, we've put this out there and uh, allow people to use it. Uh, and if they happen to give us information back, uh, th then we're grateful for that. Uh, eventually we will probably look at doing more formal, uh, data collection as more people, uh, have tried this out and used it. Uh, and we can actually do some comparisons and, and see, quantify the improvements that, uh, or, or lack of improvement, if that happens to be how it works out that, uh, that people are seeing. Okay. Um, one question from the audience. Do you think that we can count on more cooperation, easier link implementation to loops from insulin pumps companies when they will see that open source algorithms are much more advanced than their commercial ones? I'm hopeful that we will. Uh, Medtronic actually has talked in the past about uh, putting out a basically a dumb pump that is just a digital syringe uh, that uh, can be controlled uh, re remotely. Uh, that was f at least the idea of that was floated at one of the uh, diabetes data exchange conferences that's run by diabetesmind.com. Uh, and they, they mentioned that it was something that they were sort of working on and that we never heard anything about it again. Uh, but, uh, th there are pumps out there that, uh, are more open and, uh, easier to integrate into these systems. Uh, the, the Dana pumps, uh, that are available in some parts of the world, uh, and, uh, there are others as well. And these new advanced algorithms are catching up fast. Uh, the Omnipod dash is now supported in some of these open source systems. Uh, and so even, even if we don't get full cooperation from, uh, fr from industry, I don't think that, uh, the do it yourself community is going to wait around for, uh, somebody to come up with an ideal pump for them to use. Yeah. I think the do it yourself, uh, community is going to make everything to be faster and better and more effective uh, than, uh, the commercial or used, uh, systems. So, um, Thanks. Hope so. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Uh, that was really awesome. Looking on your work, it was like the 3D model. I, I, we, I, we were talking a few days ago about your 3D model uh, and your uh, like going out of the box and looking on, on the data. And it's very important for everybody that is working uh, in th these days um, for the future of our community to get out of the box. If think about uh, not uh, how do you call it? Not that obvious, um, obvious, uh, things and uh, not so obvious data and look on every data from every, in every possible point of view. So, uh, I must say from the point of view of me, uh, for my point of view, uh, for you people that are doing the difference, that are making the difference in our uh, community and for us, uh, diabetes people, um, very, very huge thank you for your work and hopefully looking forward for more and more of your uh, algorithms uh, dynamic algorithms work and turning the you know the screwdriver and getting them better and better well i'm, I'm just uh, glad that i'm able to contribute i mean it's this is all built on a foundation that goes back you know almost 10 years now uh with, from the very first people who figured out how to get their CGM data and share it on the internet uh, and everything that's been built from there. Uh, Dana Lewis with open, the original open APS uh, system, and then all the people that have developed Android APS and the, the other systems that have sort of grown up uh, out of that ecosystem. Uh, they, without the platform that they provide, we wouldn't be able to test this, so. Yeah, actually uh, Night Scout was, the, was a game changer here. Totally agreed. Um, say hi to Ben. I know you guys are almost, are almost, uh, neighbors. <laughs> um, Close. yes. 
very very much of of love from Poland uh, and hopefully uh, I'm really excited for next year's and the next year's conferences to meet offline so maybe if you have time and your work we're gonna go forward say uh, just feel invited and uh, and come to Poland to visit our uh, our uh, our great country um, but uh, remember that most of your uh, American um, closed loop systems are not available in Poland. Only <laughs> Medtronic, only only Medtronic 70, 780 uh, is available here in Poland from the official uh, sources. So, well, I'll, I'll look forward to, uh, to. I would love to visit. So, uh, if uh, it uh, becomes an option at, at some point in the future, obviously with the the pandemic and uh, other situations that may make travel. Uh, difficult but uh I'll, if the the invitation remains open and it's possible i'm happy to come visit i would i would love to uh to see poland that's great fingers crossed for all of the bad things that can be good things and we can meet in person uh during uh next couple of years take care chris right. thank you very much